everyone, and welcome to Collider Movie Talk, movie talk for movie fans. I'm your host, Natasha Martinez, and this is the daily show where we share with you all of the latest news from the world of movies, plus some insight into what it all means. Joining us today is Dennis Zen. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another brand new episode of Collider Movie Talk. And we've got uh, our lovely special guest, Perry Nemiroff. I'm back. Woohoo! And Mr. Mark Ellis. Oh, what, I'm not lovely? I mean, you're, you're lovely. I'm here all the time. I can't be lovely, too. Come yeah. on. <laughs> okay. It looks like details from Star Wars Episode Seven weren't the only thing J.J. Abrams has been hiding for the past year. And a surprise to everyone, J.J. Abrams and Paramount Pictures have released a trailer for 10 Cloverfield Lane. Is this a sequel to the 2008 Matt Reeves monster movie Cloverfield? Kind of. Here's what J.J. Abrams told Collider.com. The idea came up a long time ago during production. We wanted to make it a blood relative of Cloverfield. The idea was developed over time. We wanted to hold back the title for as long as possible. Not only did the teaser come out of nowhere, the release date for 10 Cloverfield Lane is actually only a few months away and drops on March 11th this year. The movie is being directed by Dan Trachtenberg and stars John Goodman, Mary Elizabeth Winston, and jo John Gallagher Jr. as three people that are confined in a cellar due to a disaster that they've been told is happening above ground. Dennis, what do you make of the surprise announcement and teaser trailer for 10 Cloverfield Lane? Well, I mean, for all intents and purposes, we're going to call it Cloverfield 2. We know it's not exactly <laughs> Cloverfield 2. It's called 10 Cloverfield Lane, but that's what we're going to call it. We put it in the title. Uh, I'm super excited about this. One, I enjoyed the first one. I mean, it wasn't my favorite movie, but I'd like the movie going experience of, uh, of seeing the first one. I, I like that this is a surprise. We, we you know, generally we're a little pessimistic in, the, in this kind of community because we kind of know what's coming, right? We've all always seen i mean i can't remember the last time i was this surprised maybe when they announced batman v superman at comic-con maybe two years ago mm -hmm. i had no idea that was coming and, and this was a huge surprise for me and I, 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 the trailer for me got me excited for it. Uh, Perry, what did you think? Even then, with what you're saying about surprises with Batman versus Superman, it's like you hear a surprise like that and you get all pumped for it then, but then you're like, oh no, like I've got how many years yeah. or how many months to wait for it? <laughs> this this is coming. Like We just got this. It looks incredible, and it's coming really soon. I'm a huge Cloverfield nut. I've been watching the movie kind of over and over ever since the movie came out, and while I do have some issues with found footage, that was one of the the first found footage movies that I watched, I'm like, I, I kind of want to make something like that. It feels like I could do that, which I guess could be turned in a negative way, but I think that's an incredible movie, and this looks, this looks like something else. Like, low budget, three characters, really intimate setting, and that trailer just drives you through the story in such a perfect way where ever so slowly it kind of teases, something's not right, something's not right, until you get to that window at the end and you're like, Cut to black, I need to know what's outside the window, also because I need to know how it fits into this Cloverfield universe. Mark? I am going to be missing so much college basketball this March. Between the Cloverfield movie coming out now with Batman v Superman and Daredevil on Netflix, like my March is stacked with just this kind of stuff, and I'm pumped about that because this trailer was awesome. J.J. Abrams does a lot of things well. He crushes one thing, and that's hatches. Just like the Dharma Initiative in, in Lost, that's, I felt like I was back in that hatch on that island because it's just, okay, we're just hanging out. Just We, we got nothing else to do. We got nowhere to go, and then all of a sudden somebody makes a run for it, and you're right. It, it built up such a level of suspense watching that it was a perfectly crafted trailer and it's going to have everybody buzzing about what the hell is this movie in relation to the first Cloverfield. To me, it felt like it was taking place somewhere else that's not a big city where maybe the events of Cloverfield have just happened. And so whatever the, the government or the powers that be, the military had to do to quell that threat, maybe the fallout from that is what we're dealing with in 10 Cloverfield Lane. But that's, again, we're just all speculating at this point. And then speaking of J.J. Abrams, I mean, he's not directing it, but he's producing right. it. He had the perfect distraction he was working on star wars the force awakens right so everyone's concentrated on that they want to ask him questions about that they're trying to get all these details and over on the side he, he's secretly producing this movie and he secretly produced this movie with an absolutely incredible cast there was also a quote that we had gotten from mary elizabeth winstead a while back i think it might have been while she was promoting faults which is actually kind of similar to this because it's one of those situations where it's like you don't know who's telling the truth and it seems like they're going to play with that really well here and she's incredible in that movie if you haven't seen faults i highly recommend checking it out also with this coming out but we've also got and i'm going to say his name wrong dan dan 
Trachtenberg, the director. <laughs> if you haven't seen his short film, which is on YouTube right now, it's called Portal No Escape. It's like six, seven minutes. It almost feels like a uh, futuristic uh, music video kind of where some woman is trying to escape from a room. I mean, it's actually yeah, it's a, a fan, little it's a similar. It's a film that's based on Portal the Video oh, Game. Oh, really? <laughs> and so he did that and he got a lot of attention it's from this. It's incredible. Yeah, this is his first feature film that he kind of got from doing the short film that ever. He's done, I think, a few shorts and maybe a little like internet stuff before. He's actually from um, that one show on Revision for Three. I forgot what the name of it, but he's he he was uh, like a host. He used to talk on on shows, but he also was a filmmaker on the side. So I'm excited to see what he can do, especially given what he was able to do with the small budget of portal. Oh my! The way he manipulates the portals for the fight sequences, it kind of just blew my mind. I just want to go check out the original Cloverfield again too. Like I want to go revisit that, see if I can find some sort of clue because if they came up with this idea during production for that, it's like okay, maybe it's he said it's a blood relative. I'm still trying to figure out: is it an aunt? Is it an uncle? Is it a brother? What the hell is this in relation to the first one? Yeah, and also, is it actually connected? I mean, at all, it, right? At all, because maybe it's a, a spiritual type of thing where it's like a, a Twilight Zone or a Black Mirror thing where it's okay, it's the name Cloverfield. Is Cloverfield going to be a franchise going forward that like it's going to deal with maybe a, a lower budget kind of smaller cast type of thing that has something to do with a. A, a disaster or you know and, and is that the through line for all these black mirror was the first thing that came to mind when i first saw this thing and saw the the title card at the end i i think that if it's not connected to cloverfield enough mm -hmm. that title card is going to feel like jj abrams and his team kind of pulling the rug out from under us i don't think he would have done what he did with the with the end title where you have cloverfield and then the rest of it fades mm -hmm. in if it really wasn't like firmly connected but at the end of cloverfield they dropped the bomb to kill should I not spoil that? <laughs> it's been it's been out for okay. a long time. They dropped the bomb minute. to kill the monster, so it's and they mentioned that it's like a nuclear fallout. So I'm I'm assuming that's how it's connected. But then I think some of the details is like the two other two characters uh, are listening to John Goodman and what he says about what's going on up there. So it's not exactly there's a lot of manipulation. It's supposed to be a thriller as well, which makes me think a little Walking Dead, mm -hmm. like where Rick wakes up in the entire world. Like maybe something happened to the two of them where they were, I don't know, knocked unconscious or in a coma. And then they come to and he just happened to rescue them. I, I don't know. You got to know more about the story. By the time the movie comes out, we'll get another trailer. We'll get a little oh, bit yeah. of a hint as to what this is. But it would be kind of cool to just go into a theater March 11th knowing we're paying to see this one thing we saw a teaser trailer for and we really have no idea what the fallout is. Yeah, because people have always been saying, wouldn't it be cool if like something like a, a Avengers all of a sudden they dropped it and it came out three months later? Well, it could never <laughs> happen with a movie that big, right. but something like this works. I just hope that that end sequence in the trailer is the end of the first act, though. Like If that happens at the end of the movie or towards the end of the movie, I'm going to be very disappointed that that like there we don't get to see what's out there. You don't want to see a movie about John Goodman drinking a beer, putting a puzzle together for two hours, and uh, then something happens. Is it, wasn't that called Roseanne that he was <laughs> in? <laughs> All right, uh, what's next? Dan. A few days ago, we discussed some quotes from Mad Max Fury Road director George Miller about not wanting to return to direct the franchise due to the exhausting production of the film. But now it looks like that may not have been the case. In an interview with The Wrap, Miller said the following. That was a completely garbled interview. I was in New York and it was so noisy and the journalist was asking me questions on a red carpet at the National Board Review. She completely got the wrong frag fragments of information that were just not true. I said, no, another Mad Max movie will not be next. And she took that to mean I never wanted to make another Mad Max. It won't necessarily be next, but I have two more stories. Mark, do you think George Miller was misinterpreted and will he be returning to direct more Mad Max movies? Yeah, I think George Miller is coming back to do more Mad Max movies and I think it, I, I take him at his word. It was a little noisy. Red carpets can get crazy. There's a lot of stuff going on at the same time. So I just kind of believe this story. I don't think it was any nefarious plot on the part of the reporter to get out misinformation. I don't think George Miller was drinking all day and then decided he said, I'm not going to do a Mad Max. I think it just mistakes happen sometimes. I think this is one of those incidents. Perry? 
I think that he is definitely going to move forward with making another Mad Max movie. But in terms of how they changed the quote, I mean, if you read the original thing, I kind of believe the reporter that he <laughs> said these words. Because not only did he say he wasn't going to do another Mad Max movie, but it was followed by like two or three sentences of that movie was the hardest thing I ever had to make and about how he wouldn't want to have to take that plane flight even. So it seemed it seemed a little bit of a stretch Which, that he's yeah. like, I was misquoted. And I just read that. I, I read into that. That even at the time is it, like okay he doesn't want to do that next it's like he just wants to do a smaller project and then maybe get back into Mad Max he I mean, like the guy's never... a young 73 or whatever he is <laughs> he, re- he really is he also never specifically mentioned directing I mean he could be involved in any capacity none of these quotes the quote before or the quote now says anything about directing so mm-hmm. for all we know Maybe he will direct something else next, and then after that, he will focus on producing or even executive producing a Mad Max movie. Well, I don't know if he's misinterpreted or not, but I'm happy that he's saying he's going to be involved. I hope he's directing. I feel like Mad Max is something like how Terminator should have been with James Cameron. They, there should have been only James Cameron Terminator movies. I feel like there should only be George Miller Mad Max movies. And it was it was like my number one movie of the year. I know a lot of people out there have written it's an overrated film and I, I respect your opinion I don't agree with it but the one thing I, I keep reading some people saying are oh directing action is easy and it's like no it's not it's one of the hardest things you can do like maybe directing like just explosions and this and, and that but if you want to actually direct action well you have to take in consideration like all the, the flow and the pacing and the spatial between all the different actors and all the action happening. It's one of the hardest things to do and and Mad Max Fury Road nailed it. So I, I, I think and I think a lot of people are underappreciating how good that movie is. When I think about directing anything in general, I break out in hives. Like it's just not any responsibility I ever want to take on. But an action movie, when you're watching Mad Max and you think about how you would have to compose those shots and get all of those things working together simultaneously, the stunts that were going on there, the action sequences, because you're not just doing action, you're also doing it's like a big car chase for two hours. That sounds impossible. Like that dude did an amazing job. You can't overrate that movie. You, you really can't. If you freeze frame almost any fight sequence in Mad Max and just pick out all the things that are going on in the frame. It's incredible how much they have to orchestrate and how much they have to just figure out that, oh, this shot matches with this shot. This is how we're going to paint the geography so people know where we are. You are never lost in Mad Max Fury Road and that alone is like one heck of an achievement. All right, guys. Now we're on to buy or sell. Natasha, what do we got up first? Deadline is reporting that director Jake Kazdan from Sex Tape will be helming the upcoming Sony remake of Jumanji. The original 1995 film was directed by John, Joe Johnson and starred Robin Williams and a young Kirsten Dunst. The story revolves around a board game called Jumanji that features jungle animals and obstacles that come to life as a group of kids begin to play it. Perry, buy or sell Jake Kazdan directing the Jumanji remake. I buy that they chose him to direct it. But I'm a little surprised by the choice, considering his his body of work is mostly adult comedy, which seems a little strange to me. I thought someone more like Sean Levy was going to get picked for this, because not that the Night at the Museum movies are that great, but those movies, and really most of his films, I mean, I love Real Steel, is very, you know, family-friendly, action-heavy. So I don't know if I'm that excited about him directing specifically, but, like, I buy that they picked someone. And, I mean, the movie is supposed to come out later this year. It does not seem like that's going to happen. But they had to lock someone now. And, he, I mean, he's a talented director. So, yeah, I buy it. Mark? Uh, I Yeah, I, I'm with Perry. I buy that it's happening. I'm a fan of all things Kazdan. So, if you put his name on something, even if it's a son of Lawrence Kazdan, I'm still going to be into it. I, I, I didn't like Sex Tape at all. I was very let down by Sex Tape. I thought it was a great premise that just went in the toilet. I'm a huge fan of Orange County, though. If you haven't seen Orange County, it's, it's one of the more underrated comedies you can check out. It's very, very funny. A lot of great cameos in there. Jumanji's not going to be anything like either one of those films, I don't think, unless it's like a creepy adult role-playing board game, which is going to get totally different when you have a rhinoceros charging into the bedroom. But I don't know if that's the case. I was I was shocked because we were currently at Collider. We're doing like our top five most anticipated movies of the year for each studio. And so when you're talking about Sony Pictures releasing Jumanji, it's like, well, they wanted to come out Christmas this year and now they're attaching a director to it? It seems a little late in the game. I guess you could speed it up, but with an effects-heavy movie like Jumanji, that's a lot of post-production work, too. So I'm not sure it's going to be under the Christmas tree this year. I'm going to sell it. Nothing against Jake Hasden. I didn't care for sex tape either, but I did like uh, Walk Hard, the Dewey Cox story. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
But I just, I'm not interested in seeing this remake at all. I, I, the original Jumanji, I didn't really, I didn't hate it, but I just, it, it was kind of forgettable for me. The only reason I saw it was because Robin Williams was in it, and obviously he's not going to be in this one, so I, I just have no interest in it. Well, that's the big problem for me with this movie, is that I don't know how you can get anyone to play that role quite like he did. That is his role all the way. He is perfect for it, and I can't wait until they start announcing casting, just out of sheer curiosity. But also, I don't even know if we need a Jumanji remake, because have you watched it recently? Because if you love it as a kid, it still holds up to this day in that respect very well. I mean, if you're watching it for the first time now, you might look at it and laugh, but as someone who grew up watching that movie over and over, I can watch it now and still get just as excited about everything. All right, what's next? James Franco is currently working on directing and starring in an adaptation of Greg Sestero's book, The Disaster Artist, My Life Inside the Room. The behind the scenes story about the making of the infamously terrible movie, The Room, directed by Tommy Wiseau. It looks like in addition to himself, his brother Dave, Seth Rogen, Allison Brie, Zac Efron, Kate Upton, Josh Hutcherson, and others, Franco has now added Oscar-nominated actor Brian Cranston to the film. Cesaro, the, uh, the author of the book, announced it on Facebook along with including some new photos. Dennis, buy or sell Brian Cranston joining the disaster artist. I buy it. I'm not sure who's going to play, but because uh, maybe he's going to be an extra in the film, because if you've seen the movie, there isn't really a character for him, but maybe he'll be a crew member, or, I don't know, someone behind the scenes. But I think this movie, I'm really looking forward to it, just because it's, it's so strange for such a strange movie. I mean, you have James Franco, who's going to direct it, star in it, and then have his brother play the other character, who in the, in, in the real life is not any way related or even looks like... James Franco. So I, I, I'm I'm excited to see this. I'm pretty pumped for it. And like, I totally buy that Brian Cranston is going to be in it. This seems like something he would take. He's got a pretty diverse resume. So I feel like he'd see a project like this come along and be like, that could be a good opportunity, even if he is only some sort of like background player, whether he's an extra or behind the scenes kind of guy. And he's on set for maybe like one or two days. But I could see him getting involved in this. And geez, that cast, I mean, I didn't think it could get better, but adding his name to the list is certainly one heck of a new addition. Mark? The cast is why I would want to buy it, but I just, I sell this this premise. It just doesn't sound like anything I'm remotely interested in. Like, the room is such a pile of garbage. I know people go crazy for it, and they love going out to a theater and seeing this just, a bunch of crap on screen for two hours and celebrating how bad it is. I've never been one of those people. I've never seen it. I don't care to ever see it. I just heard it's terrible, so naturally I don't want to waste my time watching it. If it's it's so bad it's laughable. I hope you enjoy the hell out of it. For this, I can't believe you're getting this collection of talent into a movie that is going to be about the making of one of the worst movies of all time. I get that it might, that, that, that maybe they're going for like an Ed Wood vibe here with like, because, you know, that's about the making of Plan 9 from Outer Space, and that movie's not good either, but it just doesn't seem like anything I'd be interested in. I will say that James Franco, like those pictures were intriguing to me because it he's committed to this role, and it seems like they're going to sprinkle in all these other very talented, famous people somewhere in the film. I love Brian Cranston. I just don't care about the project. That's because, Mark, you have not seen the movie is The Room. Is it that bad? <laughs> okay, see, this is, okay, so you have bad movies, right? Yeah. Like, I consider, like, Transformers Age of Extinction is a pretty bad movie. You have like this like goes it goes up to that other level. It goes it transcends the other bad <laughs> movies to a point where it just it, it's on another level and you have to see it. I think that's why you're not interested. You have to see the room okay. before this if you is a watch pretty it. Fair pitch you're getting right here. If you watch the room, then <laughs> you will be interested in this movie because there are things in this movie that happen that that will blow your mind. You're like, "Wow, how how did they make this movie? It's crazy. There's not a lot of people. You're, I know you, Dennis. You're not a used car salesman. You're, you're, you're passionate about what you're selling me right now, and so I might have to check it out but, because, look, but, what, one of my favorite things to watch of all time is a bad movie, and it's called okay. Planet of the Dinosaurs, and it's atrocious. It was made in 1979. It's hilariously bad, but I don't want to see like a making of movie about how that came together. That, that, that's where... That, that's where this premise is losing me. It's like it's one thing to go see The Room and just laugh at how bad it is, but you want to see a making of that. Oh, sure. 
Really? Have you oh. ever seen the documentary uh, Best Worst Movie about That's Troll Two? That's a great 2? documentary. And it shows like all the like uh, all the people behind that movie and how it came no. to be. It's uh. incredibly fascinating and a very well done doc. That's the first movie that comes to mind when I think of the room and what's going on here too. And as someone who's tried to make movies in my life, I'm so insanely fast. I'll see anything about making a movie, and especially a bad movie, because you know you reference Transformers. It never ceases to amaze me how movies like that get made considering how many people are involved how much money is involved like doesn't somewhere someone along the way realize you know that's not a good idea we shouldn't do that it's i'll celebrate horribility with you guys if you're that <laughs> committed to it then i'll have to check the, the one thing out. is you cannot watch it alone though you have to watch it with a group of people right because you have to everyone just looks at each other like what did I, I saw a clip of it i saw the the state doggy or whatever yes. when he's leaving and that's it, one it of the pictures giggle, that was it that, yeah. that they released with the, the infamous like where he goes into the store and he's oh hi doggy yeah like okay. i okay I'll, I'll i'll try okay i'll make the effort kids. all right for you <laughs> the viewer i'll make the effort all right guys now we're on to our weekly friday segment called box office predictions where we predict what's going to be ranked in the top five of this weekend so this is going to be an interesting week this week because i don't think any of us have star wars at number one uh marco what, what do you got <sighs> the force awakens is finally going to take a nap it's still going to make plenty of money i had the force awakens coming in at number three actually at number one i have right along two simply because the, the team of Kevin Hart and Ice Cube have been promoting this movie 24-7 for the last month. They're all over every channel I'm on. And the first one did very well opening weekend. Despite what you want to say critically about the movie, I think it's going to do very well, at least this weekend. Then I have The Revenant sliding in at number two because... Normally, I think I would have Star Wars still overtaking that again this weekend, but because of the Oscar nominations and everybody wants to see Leo's performance, I'm going to go Revenant 2, Star Wars 3, um, and then I, I'm going to have 13 Hours at 4. Everybody should see 13 Hours. I thought it was phenomenally done. I love that movie. And at number 5, it's a, it's, it's a bear fight between Norm of the North and you know what? I made so many stupid bear jokes yesterday. <laughs> I'm barely going to get Norm of the North in there at number 5. Perry? Yeah, I'm kind of going with the same list. Kevin Hart just has this effect on people. I don't understand it. I had no interest in Ride Along. I'm not going to see Ride Along too, but I think enough people are going to see it to make it number one this week. Then I'm putting The Revenant down, you know, awards buzz. And it did really well last week and also. So I think, you know, Star Wars is on the faster decline at this point. Revenant's coming in at number two. Star Wars at number three. 13 Hours, I think, is going to be number four. And... It's not going to do it's not going to do great. I think it's going to come in a little behind what Pain and Gain made opening weekend, maybe like 15, 17 million, something like that, and then Norm of the North right behind, <laughs> maybe around 10. Uh, I'm going to put right along to like you guys at number 1. Yeah, I I saw it on Monday with you get with you, you and mm -hmm. Christian and John and yeah, didn't care for yeah. it. I, I think the 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 Conan video with with Kevin Hart and Ice Cube is funnier than that entire movie. The promotion <laughs> material yeah. is hysterical. It really is. It's just the movies. Yeah. And it's not. So, uh, and, and number two, I have The Revenant as well. It's been in, it's already been Star Wars, you know, on a daily basis right mm -hmm. now. And I'm going to make a bold prediction. And I'm actually not going to put Star Wars at number three. I'm going to put 13 hours at number Ooh, three. It's fair. I, I have a feeling like people, there's going to be an interest in this. You know, there's a lot of people that like, they, they're interested in Benghazi, Benghazi. They don't even know what it is, but they just say the word Benghazi all the time. And I have a feeling that you're gonna get some of that audience out there like oh you should go check out this 13 hours da, da, da. Um, and I'll put Star Wars at number four sadly uh, mm -hmm. and number five I'll put daddy's home I, it's it's doing pretty well I saw it and I actually enjoyed it so I, I saw, I've yet to see daddy's home I'll watch that Oof. right after I watch the room but I <laughs> right along too just seems like it's gonna be taking the comedy dollar and you always want some movie to take kids to even if it is Rob Schneider voicing a polar bear so okay. All right, guys, now on to Mailbag, uh, where you can email us at collidervideo at gmail.com. We answer your questions. Uh, before we get to that, I want to remind you that we're going to take live Twitter questions at the end of the show. I guess, are we, are we, did you want to do like a more filmmaking bent it, on this it live sounds Twitter? It like okay. a fun idea to okay. me. Okay, well, we're not going to make it exclusive, but if you have any filmmaking type questions, uh, Natasha will pick them out for us. But first, let's get on to Mailbag. Very well, then. Eddie Johnson <laughs> writes... Look, look what you started, Mario. Look what you started. Fire again. Collider crew, love you guys. Do you think we could ever have a movie with a part one and two, like Avengers Infinity War or Justice League, come out in the same calendar year? Why or why not? Mark? 
Uh, I don't think you're going to see movies on that scale come out in the same calendar year. It just doesn't make sense from a marketing standpoint. Even though I like, I was one of those idiots that for five seconds got really excited when I saw that fake screenshot of Batman v Superman. Even though that wasn't the same calendar year, it would have been within a year's time. And I'm like, oh, this does sound pretty cool. And then I came to my senses, sobered up, and was like, there's no way this is real. I just don't think you're ever going to see it with Marvel, and I don't think it makes sense for DC to do it either. I mean, if they were going to do it, you'd have to span it out somewhere. Somewhat, right so you'd have to say like okay part one of justice league let's say is coming out around the same time batman v superman is going to come out in march because you're not you don't want to release it in january february so it's coming out in march and then you could potentially say then christmas time maybe around thanksgiving is when the next part would come out but it just doesn't seem like it's it's in anybody's best interest besides us fans <laughs> to see those two movies that quickly back to back so i don't i don't i don't see it going down Perry? yeah i'm saying that's pretty much impossible also from just like a logistical standpoint i mean these studios they're big companies they have big teams but do you really want people working overdrive to promote the, i mean look how good the deadpool promotion is mm -hmm. i guarantee you that there's a very specific team focusing super hardcore on making that promotional campaign the best it could possibly be if you're doubling up that's going to ruin that and also i wonder if they're concerned about just oversaturating the market i mean we are getting how many superheroes every superhero movies every single year if they started to release a part one and part two in the same calendar year i i wonder if one would wind up hurting the other it's possible i mean john in our pre-production meeting mentioned uh, the Matrix sequels that they came mm -hmm. out about six months apart. I don't know financially if that hurt those movies at all. But from from a storytelling point, though, it makes sense because the way I see it is, okay, uh, Avengers Infinity War Part 1. It's probably going to leave on a cliffhanger, right? Then are you going to have a mo another Marvel movie in between that time? I forgot what's scheduled, right? So uh, I forgot. I don't know if it's in humans or whatever. Some other movie. How is that taking place when this this whole like universe ending uh, event is happening? So is it is it a side story? So from a storytelling standpoint, it makes sense. However, yeah, marketing financially, it doesn't because not only that. Remember, you got to get the Blu-ray release out too. So you 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 market the movie, it comes out. Then what? Three months later, you release the Blu-ray and trying to get people to buy that, and then. A month or two later, you're, you're promoting the next one. It, it, it's it's rough. You see, you release the Blu-ray, right? Yeah. And then you give them $2 off the ticket to go see the next movie <laughs> the next week. It's a genius idea. Book it, sell it, ship it. Okay. All that right. was frightening. <laughs> All right, what's next? Alex Dunkley writes, Hey, guys, over the last few weeks, you have been discussing how George Lucas made a big mess with the prequels and how he is not the greatest director or writer. So I was wondering what your thoughts were on why he wrote and directed the original Star Wars film and why that became such a phenomenon. Thanks and all the best. I think he did a fantastic job with Star Wars A New Hope and with both writing and directing. But the way I see it is... is writing and directing is kind of like a muscle that like you have to exercise and it was i think 22 years between because remember he did not direct uh empire strikes back or return of the jedi he did write it i think lawrence kasdan helped him write both of those mm -hmm. he hadn't directed anything between a new hope and phantom menace and between that time i think he just lost some of what he had and not only that he became very focused on technology he was focused on the cameras and the visual effects and all that stuff and it seems like he kind of lost that so it's not that he wasn't good or great before hence you know star wars and the success of that i think he just kind of lost it along the way Perry? there were a lot more uh cooks in the kitchen too at that point you know after you make these three great movies that go on to become a legacy and a lot of people get involved and a lot of people have opinions and I think that probably had a little something even though he is very into his ideas but I think that probably had something to do with the direction everything went in in terms of why it's a phenomenon I mean does that question <laughs> need answering I that's I mean this this kind of shaped my childhood because I love the world I love the characters and who doesn't want to like just transport themselves to Star Wars for however many hours Absolutely yeah. Star Wars a New Hope was great because George Lucas is a goddamn genius that's hmm. why it's awesome and you can say whatever you want about the prequels which I'm not a fan of the prequels that much either but I agree with Dennis and Perry it's like when you take that much time off and I know he did other movies he had other projects he was involved in but like Howard the Duck and Radio Land Murders I believe he directed both of those and then he goes back to something like Star Wars where he has full omnipotence 
to do whatever he want, and he's literally got no constraints. When he was in 1977 and trying to get Star Wars made, he had a lot of strings to hold him down, and he didn't have a big budget. That's pretty much the greatest independent film I've ever seen. And so when you can't do all the technological things that you wrote on paper, you're forced to exercise a different muscle that would be your storytelling ability. We need to focus on characters because we can't do all these grand ideas I have just yet. So then when you are able to do whatever you want technological-wise, you can sometimes sacrifice what you shouldn't have, and that's storytelling. And plus, nobody was going to tell George Lucas no when he's making the prequels. He wasn't George Lucas that we know now back in the 70s when he was trying to get Star Wars made. So there's your Yeah, difference. he wasn't just George Lucas, the director. He was George mm -hmm. Lucas, the owner of the studio making it. He, he controlled all the finance. There was literally no one saying, oh, you can't do that. There's nothing you can't do. He's like, I can do anything I want. But as right. those films, that's like the problem because as the films got bigger and as the technology grew, I mean, he just... He, I don't see how it's possible how he could have controlled everything to the extent that it needed to be controlled. He had to rely on other people in some respect, and you know maybe he just didn't, especially mm -hmm. in the uh, visual effects department. Yeah, that's why I think kind of like this petition of trying to get George Lucas back to the star to direct it is it, it's silly. Look, if you didn't like the Force Awakens, that's fine. That's your opinion. I I don't agree with you, but to get George Lucas back it's he's not he hasn't been directing for so long if if you want to get someone else or your 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 petition to get someone else okay i mean i don't believe in those petitions anyways but George Lucas just he just hasn't had it in so long i just have strange magic popping into my head right now <laughs> 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 Every time someone says something negative at this point about George Lucas, all I can do is like hear those songs playing in loop on my in my head, and it's just driving me insane. <laughs> <laughs> all right, what's next? Colby Bean writes, Hey guys, so the other day I watched What's Eating Gilbert Grape for the first time, and I absolutely loved it. But throughout the film, I kept forgetting Leonardo DiCaprio was in the movie because his performance was so good. I kept thinking it was an actor that really had special needs. So my question for you is, have you ever been watching a movie and forgot a certain actor was in it because their performance was so good? Another one that comes to mind is Robin Williams in One Hour Photo. Thanks and have a great day. I can't think of a specific performance, but I know one actor is Gary Oldman. He's, I mean, he's been in a range of, I mean, he was Commissioner Gordon in the Chris Nolan Batman movies, and then he was Sirius Black in the Harry Potter movies, then he played Drexel. I mean, if you've ever watched True Romance and you know the character of Drexel, that is a far departure from either one of those two. He was in Dawn of the Planet Apes, and it's not, it's not like, um, maybe an actor you see in a movie where it's like, oh, I... I, I don't remember he was in that because they were forgettable. He's always memorable. It's you forget it's Gary Oldman because he's such a chameleon. He disappears into those roles. Do you guys have a specific actor or performance you guys can think of? I think I'd go for the obvious and say Heath Ledger as the Joker because still when I watch this movie today, that performance blows my mind. And not just because he has the makeup. It's like the whole physicality and the, the sound of his voice. Everything is like completely different from what I normally saw from him. But I'm going to go with Will Smith for concussion because hey it's Oscar time and I feel bad that he didn't get a nomination because I said it on the show yesterday saw the first trailer I'm like he's gonna distract me this entire movie went and actually saw the movie a couple minutes in I'm like you are him I am done you are not Will Smith good job I would say Abraham Lincoln in Lincoln. That guy was oh, so yeah. good in that movie. I mean, I know he was the president. Yeah. They just resurrected him. They <laughs> dug him up 150 years later. But he gave a great. He's a great president. He's also apparently a great actor. I would also throw Sam Rockwell as one of those guys that I just once he's in a movie, I'm just locked into whatever that character is, and I forget I'm watching an actor. I would also say Hilary Swank is really good at that too, and Meryl Streep is somebody. I'm always aware that it's Meryl Streep, but you got to mention her because she's just so good at playing whatever role she's playing. Well, I thought they took a time machine and then got uh, Abraham Lincoln and said, hey, we're going to put you in this movie, brought him back here, and then... See, oh, I thought they dug him up. Oh, okay. I thought they dug him <laughs> like up. Like G.I. Joe and Serpentor? Yeah, where they, they, like, they, they cast a spell. Okay. Yeah, so okay. I'm not sure how it actually went down. Okay. Harry, you I wonder insight? what that does to the budget. I, a movie. I, I imagine <laughs> well, that well, you don't have to pay him that much money because like <laughs> you give him a you know a few dollars and then if you give a witch a million dollars you can get somebody resurrected from the dead I'm pretty sure <laughs> then we could get two Avengers movies in one year let's Sweet. get a witch to make that happen <laughs> witch. witches need to direct yes. all right guys that's it for mailbag now on to your live Twitter questions you can tweet us at collider video on Twitter and Natasha will pick some out for us. Uh, Natasha, you got some for us? Yes. Joe Flaherty writes, Hey, love this show. I was wondering, with, this, with the success of The Revenant, do you think we'll see more filmmakers using natural light? Uh, 
I don't think so, just because it's such a pain in the ass. Because uh, they had to basically wait around a lot of the time till till the, either the weather or the light was perfect for, for the scene that they wanted to do. So a lot of times they, they said they had to wait either weeks or months or days or hours just sitting around. So I, I think only certain filmmakers can get away with something like that. And you have to have kind of a small cast, small crew. But I, I think people will do it in the future, but it's going to be very rare. Yeah, you really need everyone committed. And, like, he's a very specific filmmaker. Like, he can pull something like that off. I don't know if many other people can. I mean, maybe that opens the door to just the question of using practical lighting instead. That seems like a more reasonable thing, focusing on just using practical instead of everything else. I think you're going to see a lot of filmmakers use natural light for about a week. And then they're yeah. going to be like, screw this. Get the lights. Just don't tell anybody. Like, it just sounds like too harrowing of a journey for people to want to go on. And one interesting fact is they actually did use a couple lights what? In, in, in the campfire what? scenes. Oh, my. God. But everything else was natural light. It doesn't matter. My world Take the right. Oscar nominations away. Okay. <laughs> All right. What's next? Corey writes, who decides which part of a movie gets scored or like in Star Wars, which characters get their own themes? Thanks. Uh, I mean, that, that's something between the director and the composer. I mean, the director tells the composer, OK, we need a theme for this person. I mean, not every movie has themes for every character. It's just certain ones. I think it just depends on the scene, too. Like, if the scene that a specific character is in, has a big fight in, is introduced in, that will call for a specific theme to highlight that moment to make it feel different than all the other beats in the movie. It's very rare that a composer gets to see, like, the entire movie without the director hovering over them saying, I want this and this and this. So it's, like, I don't think a composer's ever come to a director and been like, hey, here's the stuff you wanted. I also wrote a theme for this person and this person and this person, just in case you want it. Like, it's usually the director making those calls and asking the composer what to do. Yeah. And not every movie has every character. Yeah, I don't know. Like, I'm sure, like, right along, too, they're not like, oh, here's Kevin Hart's theme and here's Ice Cube's. You know what I mean? Like, it, yeah. it's certain movies, like a Star Wars. And I kind of want to hear what Kevin Hart's theme would sound like now. <laughs> All right, what's next? La, 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 la. Carlos Gonzalez writes, why do some actors appear on IMDb as uncredited? Do they want to distance themselves from certain projects? Uh, I don't think so. Usually it's a small role or something that like maybe they kind of like uh, Edward Norton. I think he's uncredited for uh, Kingdom of Heaven, that Ridley Scott movie. And he plays and he's like covered up so you don't actually see him. I don't know. Do you guys have any other thoughts on that? I, I guess it's a case by case basis, but I'm just assuming that it would be, you know, a small role that didn't warrant a title card or anything like that and it's probably personal preference yeah and i don't think it's necessarily like, oh that movie sucks i can't hmm. believe i did it i think it's just sometimes it's a small role and you just it's just you just don't feel like you need to be credited for it i don't or, really or trust maybe, imdb that much or maybe it's a surprise maybe it's something they wanted to be like oh i don't want to be sure, credited so sure. like when i show up everyone will be like oh my god hmm. like i i don't know i'm not sure but was channing tatum uh, credited for um this is the end I am not sure. Was Tom Cruise credited for uh, Len or Les Grossman or whoever that was? I think he was definitely credited for, that, yeah. credited? Credited yeah, for Les okay. Grossman. Yeah. But I mean, Chantain was kind of like a, at least for me, was a surprise when he, right, when he right, show, right. showed up. Uh, another question? Louisville writes, what's worse, clearly fake practical effects or clearly fake CG effects? <laughs> oh, that's tough. <laughs> I'll 110% go for CG, but it might be because that I edited those videos of the, the three to five minute recaps of all the original, the uh, episodes one, two, and three of Star Wars. Mm -hmm. And just when you're re doing a recap video and you're focusing so hard on specific frames and all you see is like a fake character in a real background or vice versa, it is just so insanely distracting and upsetting. It just, it absolutely drove me insane. Now, every single time I see bad CG since then, it's kind of been get, getting under my skin more than it ever has. Mark? Yeah, I, I, I'd much rather watch bad practical effects. I hate watching bad effects in movies in general. Like, it's taken me years to get over the fact that I'm going to just have to swallow it sometimes in movies. But bad, CG, it just, bad CGI, it's like, I want to leave the theater. Bad practical effects, at least you can have fun and laugh. It's like, you know, I can, oh, it looks like Muppets. Or it's like, oh, I can see the string moving the spaceship around. Like, it's kind of fun. To, it's not the room, but it's kind of fun to, you know, laugh at stuff like that. Yeah, I'll go with bad CG just because with the practical, because I've seen older movies with bad practical effects and it doesn't bother me as much as bad CG. Because with CG, I guess the technology keeps getting better and better. And I, I think uh, 
bad practical effects. I think practical effects in general have more longevity than CG too. Yeah. It's like as the technology changes with CG, you're going to notice it more and more and it's going to take away from the movie. Whereas movies that came out, you know, 20, however many years ago, I can watch them today. And even though it's like maybe crappy practical effects, something still feels the same. Yeah, bad practical effects too. It's like I still give them credit for the effort for whatever reason, more so than I do bad CG. Bad CG just feels sloppy to me. Whereas bad practical effects, I'm I'm more forgiving. I'm like, ah, they didn't have the budget, or hey, you tried. As Thanks. long as I don't see gaffer tape holding together some of the practical <laughs> effects, I'm okay. All right, what's next? Jake Silva writes: Would you rather have a great looking movie or a movie with great performances? Uh, great performances, 100. percent I don't even have to think about that because th there have been great movies. Like, uh, what was that movie? Uh, that really Scott movie, Exodus, mm -hmm. Gods and King, or whatever the hell that, that the subtitle. Gorgeous looking movie. And the performances were actually weren't that bad, but it was so boring. So I'd rather see like something shot on a, like an iPhone or Android phone with someone with the fantastic performances. I mean, just think of that movie Tangerine that just came mm -hmm. out. You know, I, I actually think that looks great for a movie shot on an iPhone too. Actually for any movie, I shouldn't even say that, but whole movie was shot on an iPhone. And I think part of the reason that that is become such a special movie of 2015 is because the lead performances in that are so incredible. And like another recent example that popped in my head, not necessarily in terms of the look of the movie, but you know, Joy wasn't a great movie, but it's got this one epic performance in the center of it. And that's kind of what makes it work. I just, I, yeah, I, I get I get really excited to go see blockbusters. Like, I see a trailer, and I'm like, oh, I can't wait to see that movie. But if it's bad, I find myself leaving and being more pissed off that there wasn't a good story than vice versa. Like, it's very mm -hmm. rare I'm going to leave a movie and have gotten a great story and been like, man, I just wish it looked better. Like, it, it just doesn't sound like it's a thought I'd have that often, you know? And I get that there's other production values that you just can't always have when you're telling a smaller story or you have a limited budget, but I'd much rather have a great story. Yeah, because bad acting for me takes me out of the movie really quickly. Right, where, right. look, it, if it's just cinematography where it's just like static camera, I mean, look at something like uh, Kevin Smith's Clerks, right? It's not like it's shot masterfully. They just lock off the camera, medium shots, wide shots, but... I feel like the, with his dialogue and the performances of the, the actors in it, like it's engaging where it's like, you can have the most beautiful shots, but as soon as an actor isn't delivering, you're just like, I, I'm out of there. I can't there, think there of a single a example of the opposite. You know? Yeah, it's it's it, it's hard to say. Like, I, I look at a movie, it's like a very condensed version of a relationship. Like the beginning, the first date, you look beautiful, fine, let's give this thing a shot. And then as it goes on and on, it's like there's just nothing behind those eyes. There's nothing behind that face. This is now this is a bad, bad human being that happens to be in a very beautiful package. It's actually not a bad analogy. <laughs> Seems like you have a lot of experience with, with that type of stuff. I a lot of experience with bad <laughs> movies and bad dates. <laughs> All right, what's next? Rashad writes, which movie genre do you think is more difficult to make successfully, comedy or horror? Uh, I, because I'm not a horror fan, I would, I would have to say comedy. Just because, like, especially because everyone's comedic uh, tastes are different. And so something that you make may not, you may think is funny is not funny to someone else. Where I think horror... I think you can get pinpoint more of what will scare people versus comedy. Comedy's all over the place. That's tough for me because I've okay. only made horror. I think I made one comedy short in film school, but I made, I produced a horror film and it, it's not easy. It's not easy making all the effects look right. It's not easy. Like something on paper can read really well where you're like, that's going to look sick. It's going to freak people out. And then all of a sudden you're on set and like, you know, the blood's not pumping the right way or a practical effect doesn't look right. Or then maybe it does look great on set. And then all of a sudden you get to post and it still does not look right with color correction that just ruined the color of the blood or something in that respect. But as someone who has only had experience making horror movies, I go for horror. <laughs> <laughs> I will break the tie and say I think comedy is just a little bit tougher to do. And I'll tell you why. Because you could put on a horror movie and it could end up being a bad horror movie. But you can at least with a horror film have that not that tough of a time building up suspense for 30 or 45 minutes. And then usually a bad horror movie, you get the reveal of what's going on. And it just isn't that scary and it doesn't pay off. But a comedy, man, a comedy can start out bad and just get worse and worse and worse. Humor is subjective. But when you do it right either one of these genres if you do it right it really pays off and you want to go back and see it again and again i just think comedy getting laughs to really hit is a little bit tougher and the the, the tightrope you have to walk is a little bit higher than with horror all right what's next 
Alexander Burton writes Eddie Redmayne and Felicity Jones in The Theory of Everything or Eddie Redmayne and Alicia Vikander in The Danish Girl. <laughs> I didn't see The Danish Girl yet, so I can't say. Uh, Mark, did you see The Danish Girl? Yeah, yeah. It's, it, it's, a, it's God, damn, that's a tough question. I'm going to have to give the tiebreaker to The Theory of Everything simply because the way that you see that relationship progress through the years was just a little more compelling to me, but it's taking nothing away from what Eddie Redmayne did in The Danish Girl and Alicia Vikander's performance, too. Like, she was so good in that movie. If you didn't have Felicity Jones being as great as she was in Theory of Everything, it would have been Danish Girl, but I'm giving the, this is, you're, there's a lot of tough questions today, Dennis. This might be the hardest one. I'm going Theory of Everything. Perry. I'm really high on Alicia Vikander right now, so I want to pick her, but The Danish Girl as a whole, I think, was way, way lower than The Theory mm -hmm. of Everything. Like, the, da the Danish Girl, I walked out not liking it to the point that I was almost a little upset. I think it should have been her story, and I think they made they made Lily come across as a little selfish because they weren't respecting how her decision would ha would change their relationship. And it was there's this one line where where Alicia Vikander is like, "I just want to hug my husband," and it broke my heart that one like that should have kind of rippled out through the entire movie, and it and it didn't. Uh, I will have to say Eddie Redmayne is a lucky dude. He gets to be in a movie with Felice, <laughs> Felicity Jones and Alicia Vikander. Yeah, it's not a bad life. Not, not, not a bad life. Uh, uh, last one. Okay, Flex writes, Ryan Reynolds dressed as Deadpool at the Deadpool movie premiere doing interviews. Thoughts? I think it's a great idea. I think he <laughs> should do it. Not only, I think on Heroes, I think uh, Schnepp and John and uh, Robert Meyer Burnett were like asking uh, Ryan Reynolds to come onto their show. I think he should he should come on to Heroes and also do uh, the red carpet in costume. The thought of him doing all of those interviews in costume is a little upsetting. I just remember when uh, Jonah Hill and Channing Tatum did it for 21 Jump Street. And if like you look at the succession of interviews that day, they just got more and more tired and uncomfortable and unhappy as it went along. <laughs> but I certainly see some sort of like Deadpool stunt going on at that premiere. The promotional campaign is heading right in that direction. Yeah, it's not going to be a normal premiere. Something is going to go wacky. Something's going to be zany. Something's going to be madcap hijinks will ensue. The Deadpool premiere. I'm not sure it's going to be that, but if I had to put money on something, it would be Ryan Reynolds showing up in costume. All right, guys, that's it for today's show. I actually want to remind you on Monday, it's a national holiday, uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday, so we're not going to have a show on Monday. Also, John Campia is actually going to be in Canada for the week, so we're doing musical chairs next week. <laughs> I think Mark's going to host, Damn I'm going right to host, Christian's going to host. We're going to have a, a big mix of people. Tune so, in. Tell yes. your friends. Tuesday is the day that Mark Ellis burns down Collider <laughs> Movie Talk. Set your DVRs. It's not TV, it's internet. Watch on the internet. And I want to thank the people joining us at the table. Uh, Perry, uh, where can people find you? You can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at P. Nemiroff, and my writing is on Collider.com. Have a very good weekend, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and they Mark, rubbed up on me. <laughs> and Mark? Uh, you can find me online, Twitter and Instagram at Mark Ellis Live. That's also my website where you can now get tickets for my show at Nashville Zanies next weekend, Thursday through Sunday, Boston, New Jersey. I got some really good news for you guys coming up. Natasha, where can people find you? You guys can find me on Instagram at Natasha A. Martinez and on Twitter at Natasha Lexis underscore. And you guys can find me on Twitter at ThinkHero on Instagram, Dennis.TZNG. And just a reminder, subscribe to this YouTube channel. That's YouTube.com slash uh, Collider videos. And we'll see you guys next week. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.